You are going to want to communicate the incident, summarize as best you can, and you're going to use those reporting mechanisms or contact lists that you created in the preparation phase. Use them to try to communicate with people what is going on. People will be very interested in what's going on, and they will want information. They won't care so much about the details, but they will want to know what happened, how it happened, when it's going to be fixed, and what impact it will have. Management would rather hear about even minor incidents than not hear anything. Make sure people know you are on top of the situation. The worst thing you can say when reporting a problem is, yes, we have the situation, but nobody knows what it is. Do your best to know what is going on so that you can instill confidence in your leadership. As we mentioned before, make sure you know who it is that is authorized to make decisions and identify what external groups you might have to work with or want to work with. That also might be an organizational decision and it may not be your decision. So know this kind of information when you're going into an incident or know where you can get this information at the needed time. Most small CI projects will most likely use an ad hoc method to forming an incident response team. When an incident happens, you're going to pull your team together and start talking about details. You will assign duties and review procedures with the newly formed team. This is a very important step with an ad hoc team. The better you do this, the better your team will perform. Letting people know what their job is will prevent confusion and keep people focused on specific tasks and not waste time doing repeating work. By reviewing the procedure, you'll help those team members know what to do and how to do it. Make sure there is some place your team can carry out their work and that secure communications are being used. You might want to consider setting up a secure wiki for the team to use. This provides a way for the team to document what they're doing while they're doing it. It also provides a way for everyone on the team to know what's going on. The information that's put into the wiki then makes writing the post-incident reports much simpler since everything is there. Also, they become a good source for review and training. The team should also employ secure email during the incident. You'll want everyone on the team to know about using PGP keys to encrypt their emails and make sure they know how to use it. Having a designated war room is a good thing too. This gives the team a location where they know they can meet and talk about what's going on. Hopefully, it gives them access to whiteboards so they can collaborate on the incident. If you are going to perform a detailed investigation, you need to start with your information sources. As we talked about earlier in these videos, you should have identified the important sources you will need for any investigation. Now, you are at the point in the incident handling that you need to start pulling those sources together and using them. This means pulling together all of the logs that you have and that are hopefully secured. With those logs, you can begin to use whatever tools you have to dig deeper into them and analyze what's going on. Usually, there are footprints left and some kinds of tracks for you to follow. You will also be analyzing the data and system files looking for any tools that might have been left behind. Often, when someone has compromised your system, they are going to leave a way to get back on it. By looking at the tools that have been left behind, you can often tell what the person did and why they were on your system. This information will also help you understand the vulnerabilities on your system. The tools being used will often point to what vulnerability was attacked and what weaknesses the intruder saw in your system. Finding what tools are being used is great information. Even if you only know the names of the tools, that tells you a lot. There is usually documentation about what those tools do, and it gives you a very good hint about what the intruder was doing. Look for any kind of data file. A lot of times, those data files are things the intruder collected. With those files, you can begin to identify what they were after. It might be a bunch of usernames and passwords, or it might be privacy information. This will tell you what they were looking for and what they were trying to get. This also will give you clues on what you need to protect more carefully and what you need to be monitoring. Look at the system files too. Were permissions changed? Have the files been modified? In one case, NCSA had an intruder who replaced SSD with a new one that would allow them to get back. 
This was identified because the file size and MD5 sum was different. Look for these kinds of changes to the system. If you don't have this information on important system files, then you should probably look at gathering it. Did the intruder gain root? This is a big one. With the gaining of root access, they can do just about anything they want on the system. This is an issue where your vulnerability management is critical to make sure that doesn't happen. But even with good vulnerability management, zero-day attacks can still happen. So you will want to know if they got root access to your system. Don't just assume you have to go forward and backward through the system logs. While those are the most logical, incidents usually end up being more three-dimensional than that. Often you will be entering an incident in the middle, and you will need to move backwards to find the start and forward to see what's going on. But you might also have to move sideways across systems and through various other components. That is why looking at other alerts that are going on at the same time is important. These alerts that might not seem related to the main one you're investigating are really important and are related. Don't get focused on a two-dimensional investigation. This is a checklist that was put together based on information from the SANS Incident Response Handbook. It is a useful tool in helping you identify the steps in a response. Use it during an incident to make sure you go through each of the identified steps. Securing evidence is not just important for you at the moment to be able to figure out what's going on. It might also be important three or four years in the future. These cases can come back even after long periods of time. There are incidents that still come up here at NCSA that are several years old. We still get calls from Campus Legal about the case. We need to be able to answer the questions they have, so we make sure we preserve the evidence. When a case falls into this category, you're usually working with other organizations, or at least you should be. You would probably want to be involved with Campus IT and Legal to make sure things are done right. If you would like more help with building a security system, please contact CTSC. You can get contact and other information on the CTSC website, trustedci.org. CTSC Online is made possible by funding from NSF, grant number OCI 1234408.